Well, good morning and welcome to those of you who braved the weather and made it here. Glad your cars started, you made it safely. And a special welcome to those joining us online this morning. Uh, we're glad you could tune in and worship with us as well. Uh, just as we get started, we want to just say thank you for coming. And for those of you here in person, just to remind you, thank you for wearing your masks, and, you know, nose to chin, uh, and doing that so that we're able to stay open as a church and able to keep meeting in person. I know that's something I enjoy, and if you're here, I assume you enjoy it too. So thanks for doing your part to make that possible for us. Uh, one quick announcement before we get started this morning. I just want to remind everyone that tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. on Zoom, we'll have our quarterly celebration. So we would love to have you join us for that. You should probably already have an email with the link for that. Uh, if you don't, feel free to contact the church office Monday. We'd be happy to send that out to you. Uh, and we'd love to have you join us for that. If you've never joined us for a quarterly celebration, this is maybe a, a nice way to ease into it when you can just do it from the comfort of your own home. But it's a great chance just to hear about some of the things God has been doing uh, in and through our church for the last quarter that maybe you wouldn't otherwise know about uh, if you don't have contact with some of those different ministry areas. So we'd encourage you to do that. We'd love to have you tune in and just hear what God's been up to here at First Free. Uh, with that, why don't you stand as we worship together this morning? Well, good morning. Thanks for enduring the cold and making it out for those who did. Uh, this past week, I was uh, had the opportunity to go to a conference, a theology conference, and based uh, all the all the talks were based on Psalms. So my head is kind of uh, full of the Psalms, if you will. But um, this uh, Psalm 136 is really interesting because it's it's different than a lot of the other Psalms. And let me just read the first verse: Give thanks to the Lord for He is good; His faithful love endures forever. And if you're aware of this, this psalm goes on and has uh, 26 some odd verses, and every verse ends with his love endures forever. And it's so true that um, our God's love endures forever. So let's sing that song forever. Thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. mighty hand and outstretched star.
Father, we do thank you and praise you that indeed your love never ends. Father, we've come today to praise your name, to gather together, to sing praises. But if we're honest, some of us have had really hard weeks. And we're not sure we have much to give thanks for. Oh, remind us today, Father, that your love never ends. Help us to trust in your love. And may that be the thing that leads us to praise you today. And Father, we thank you so much for the cross. Where would we be without the cross? So Father, we want to sing today about the cross.
Continue with reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. I'm going to invite you to join me in prayer as well this morning. Lord, we were just reminded in that prayer that you taught us to pray that we are your children and that you are our Heavenly Father, and we praise you for that truth. We're also reminded that you care for our daily needs. So, uh, Father, we, we bring our church family before you those that are struggling, might you speak to each one of them today in a way that they need to hear, in in a way that, um, Lord, they might be encouraged and ministered to. Lord, we pray for the Clinton family, the loss of John Sr. We pray for the Vatsas family, the loss of, of Chris. God, might you give each of those families as they experience that loss in their lives Give them your grace. Give them your peace in abundance. Lord, we pray for others that are ill. We pray for those that are dealing with the COVID-19 illness. God, might you give them strength. Might you heal them. We pray for each one here, that each one hears my voice, God, that they might find In you, the living God who does not grow tired or weary and who gives strength to those who wait upon him, might we each learn to wait upon you. And now we come to you and ask that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that you would allow us to see you in all of your wonder and beauty and power and holiness. God, we ask that you would meet with us so that we might be changed for your glory pray these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Though uh, skeptical of his teenage son's newfound determination (laughs) uh, to uh, develop bulging muscles, a father um, followed his teenager to the store's weightlifting department uh, where they started inspecting Um, a set of weights. Teenager said, Dad, please, please, just just let me buy these. I I, I promise I'll use them every day. Dad responded, I don't know, Michael. It's really a commitment on your part. (laughs) Please, Dad, please. You know, Father said, they're not cheap. Listen, Dad, I'll use them. I I promise I'll use them. Finally went over. The father paid for the equipment and headed out the door of the store. And after a few steps, he heard his son behind him say, What? You mean I have to carry them all the way to the car? (laughs) Commitment, right? It's hard, I think. It's hard for all of us. What uh, looked good or or sounded good in in a moment can quickly lose its luster the the further along we go, right? For example, um, and not to pick on anybody, but can I ask you uh, how you're doing on your New Year's resolutions? (laughs) You know, we uh, uh, commit ourselves to eating better or to losing weight or to getting more exercise or or I'm going to read my Bible, you know, every day. We committed to those things on January 1st, and by the first week of February, (laughs) 
um, those commitments have long since been forgotten. Now, I bring this up to date not to discourage anyone from making any um, uh, New Year's uh, resolutions, but rather because this morning we come to Luke chapter 9. And in Luke chapter 9, it's all about commitment. It's all about commitment. So turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, as we continue in our series through the Gospel of Luke. Now, this morning, we're going to be focusing on the verses uh, 18 through uh, 27. But before we get there, it's important for us to understand the context uh, of that passage, the, the verses that precede that, uh, that passage we're going to look at specifically. In the, in the story right before this passage, Jesus has just fed uh, 5,000 men along with their wives and, and their children. Uh, so it's over 5,000. And the, what he's done is, is incredible. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. He has taken this young boy's sack lunch, right? And you know the story. And he's turned it into this, this feast with, with leftovers. <laughs> um, and everyone is out there in that desolate place. They have experienced God's amazing provision. I mean, the crowd walked away from that experience not only happy, but they were fat and full and satisfied. <laughs> and you can imagine, not only were the disciples amazed by what Jesus has done, but they must have been excited by it all as well, don't you think? Why? Well, because they know that the, the word's going to spread. I mean, the, the word's going to get out. And the crowd's are going to continue to grow, and they're excited about that. I mean, who, who wouldn't want to come and hear Jesus? I mean, who, who wouldn't want to come and be, be fed or, or be healed or, you know, be satisfied? I mean, you could just hear the disciples saying, Jesus, man, let's keep this thing going. <laughs> Jesus, I, I mean, we keep this thing going. Soon we're going to have the biggest, uh, uh, most exciting thing happening in, in, in all of Israel. But see, Jesus, I got to tell you, was never impressed by the size of the crowd. It, it's the commitment level that he cares about. And I got to be honest with you, that's one of the concerns I have for our churches here in the United States today, is that when we gather um, online or, or in person, um, I think there's a possibility for us to become more impressed with the crowd than the commitment. Instead of a community of followers, <laughs> sometimes I think we, we just want to be a, a, a stadium full of admirers. Yes, we may wear a, a cross, but listen, we don't bear the cross. You can watch church online. You can, you can go to church. You can listen to a sermon on, on a podcast. You can know all the songs. You can open your Bible and you can take notes during the, the sermons. You, you can say grace before every meal, but that doesn't necessarily make you a follower of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus never invites anyone to admire him. He only invites us to follow him. So then we have to ask questions. Well, what does it take to follow Jesus? What does it take to follow Christ? And that's where we take, uh, get a chance to look at our passage today. Because Jesus in our passage today answers that question. And first of all, he says, following me requires you to uh, recognize me and who I am. To confess <laughs> um, who I am. I want you to notice what takes place immediately after, starting in verse 18, immediately after Jesus has fed these 5,000, right? Jesus is alone with his disciples, and he asks them a question. Now, my guess is that at that time, the disciples had to be still buzzing about what Jesus had just done. What they had just witnessed. I mean, can you, James, James, can, can you believe what, what just took place? I mean, we fed over 5,000 people. James responds, yeah, man, I, I mean, it just blows my mind. How exciting. I mean, everyone is talking about it. 
But then Jesus turns to these guys and interrupts their, their discussion. And he asks them a question. He says, tell me, you, you, guys, you guys were out in the crowd. You, you were out there feeding that, that crowd out there, listening to what they were all saying. Let me ask you, who do the crowds say that I am? Disciples, you can just imagine it, can't you? They, they begin looking around at each other, um, a little bit of hesitation. And then one of them says, well, some of them say they think you're John the Baptist. Another pipes in and says, yeah, well, I heard others say that they think you might be Elijah. Another chimes in and says, well, still, um, uh, some of them say that you might be one of those other prophets, another prophet who, who has come back to life. <laughs> you just see it. Jesus nodding his head. And then looking them each straight in the eye, he then asks his follow-up question. Okay, guys, that's what they say. But who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Peter, of course, <laughs> always the one to step up. He, he answers for all of them. And Peter says, well, you are the Christ of God. The crowd, catch it, those admirers that had just been fed, they thought Jesus was a, a, a pretty important person, a pretty amazing person. I mean, they were impressed with his prophetic character and what he could do. <laughs> but in truth, they had no idea who he really was. In contrast, what Peter does is he confesses that Jesus is God's promised deliverer. Jesus is the Messiah. And in confessing Jesus as the Messiah, what Peter and the other disciples do is they recognize that there is no one else like him. Nobody. He stands by himself. Jesus is, is unique. These days, of course, um, people have a lot of ideas, right? You've discovered that about who Jesus is. Some attempt to accept him as a religious leader, as a good moral teacher. Uh, they, they put him, as it were, uh, uh, in the religious hall of fame. He, he, he's been voted in. <laughs> um, but they don't necessarily think that he's unique Jeremy Bowen the presenter of a, a British Broadcasting Corporation documentary on Jesus stated this he said the important thing is not what he was or what he wasn't the important thing is what people believe him to have been a massive worldwide religion numbering more than 2 billion people follow his memory. And that's pretty remarkable 2,000 years on. I got to tell you, <laughs> Bowen couldn't be more wrong. Who Jesus is and what Jesus did is of ultimate importance. I mean, he's the foundation of our faith. And while Bowen's approach is popular in our culture because it is a, uh, a tolerant stance that really doesn't require any type of uh, commitment, what it does is it fails to see Jesus as the one and only fulfillment of God's promise, as the one and only way to God. It fails to see Jesus as unique. Admittedly, Peter and the other disciples, they needed more instruction as to who Jesus is in fact, it, it, who he really was. Um, and so he gives them that instruction starting in verse 21. Look with me. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Um, he, he, he's basically saying, hey, guys, um, um, I need to let you in on a little secret here of, of who I am because he wants to let them know that um, they would make a great mistake if they begin thinking that uh, power and glory will be the de destiny of those who follow him. 
See, confessing Christ, I got to tell you, confessing Christ always requires embracing a suffering Savior. So he wants to make that clear to him. Now, you got to understand here in the book of Luke, Peter's confession, as Luke tells it here, is a significant turning point um, for the disciples. And likewise, if we are to do more than just admire Jesus, I got to tell you something. If we're to follow Jesus, it's imperative that we recognize who Christ really is. That Jesus is the Messiah. He's God's son who came to us in human flesh and was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, paying the full penalty for our sins. And now he reigns in heaven. And one day he will judge every human who has ever lived. And to be a follower, not just an admirer, (laughs) we must believe this. And we must rest our lives on that truth of who he is. So Jesus says to each one of you here today, watching online or here in person, he asks you a simple question. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? I got to tell you, that's a question every person must personally answer. Now listen, after Peter's confession here, Jesus then calls them to follow him. Those two are linked. You catch this? Confession and following. When you confess Jesus as a savior, he immediately calls you to follow him. In fact, look at Jesus' call. Starting in verse 20, um, uh, 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? See, following Christ, and first of all, requires us to recognize who he is, right? But second, he says, it requires us to deny ourselves. It requires self-denial. Now listen, self-denial doesn't mean that we have to stop doing everything that we enjoy doing. Self-denial doesn't mean that we have to deny ourselves all the pleasures in life. Rather, it means that if we're going to be a follower of Jesus, we now live for Christ's sake, not our own. It means that when, we, when my will conflicts with his will, we need to say no to self so I can say yes to to Christ. It means we need to get rid of all those toxic assets that we are holding on to. You realize back in 2009, that economic crisis that we experienced back then, it brought us that phrase, toxic assets. See, toxic assets was uh, were one of the factors contributing to the whole trouble that the banks got themselves into back in that financial crisis. The assets were loans, so catch this, okay? Follow me on this. Somebody owed the banks money. Normally, banks want people to owe them money and then pay them interest on the principal. But back then, back in 2009, uh, many of the loans became liabilities because the houses that secured those loans uh, decreased in value below the amount of the loan. And when assets become harmful to your bottom line, they're no longer assets. Now they're liabilities. They are toxic. Let me tell you, toxic assets are not just a banking phenomenon, but I got to tell you, toxic assets can also be a spiritual uh, reality. A toxic asset is anything that we think is an asset, but actually it's hurting us. It's preventing us from following Christ. Um, Sins of the flesh, such as viewing pornography or taking illegal drugs, are toxic assets. Lying to make ourselves look better than we really are is a toxic asset. 
I mean, we engage in those sins because we think, you know, they're going to benefit us. But the opposite's true. They're hurting us. But there are other toxic assets. A house or, or, or a car can be a toxic asset when it takes over your life and pushes God to the, to the edge, to the periphery. A job can be a toxic asset. Money, education, family, um, friends, physical beauty or handsomeness, all these things can become toxic assets when you allow them to take God's place in your life and you live for them and you trust in them. And Jesus says, listen, to follow me requires you to say no to those toxic assets. So you can say yes to me every time. See, following Christ requires a basic shift of the orientation as we humbly say no to our own agenda and align ourselves with God's agenda. It means walking in a a different path than the world because God has called us to do so. It requires self-denial. Not only does it require self-denial, but following Christ also, he tells us, requires cross-bearing. You see that? He says, uh, Jesus says, we have to take up our cross. And when he said that, he isn't talking about every hardship that comes into your life. (laughs) I mean, I've heard people say, oh, man, I have this fierce temper. I I guess it's just a cross I have to bear. (laughs) I want to say, no, no, friend, that's not your cross. That's your sin. (laughs) Um, others say you know I I have to give up a lot of I I mean I have to give up chocolate man I guess that's just cross I'm gonna have to bear when we say those things what we're doing is we're trivializing Jesus's words see those disciples they understood perfectly what Jesus meant when he said take up your cross When, when when a prisoner would come with a cross strapped across his back, and they would make their way up the street. Everyone knew that that uh, that prisoner was on a one-way journey, and he wasn't coming back. They knew that they'd never see him again in this life. He was a dead man. (laughs) See, Jesus is telling us that to follow him means that we will have to endure suffering. Because we are walking now in his steps. He's talking about difficulties that we must deal with because we've embraced Christ's life. He's talking about the pushback and and the trials that you'll have to face when you're living out Christ's character and, and, and business ethics in the marketplace. He's talking about whispers and and put-downs, and and attacks that you suffer because you're listening to him instead of everyone else. That's the cross you have to bear. Linda, a first-grade teacher, tells about an interaction she had with one of her students on the first day of school. Accustomed to going home at noon when this little boy was in kindergarten, little Ryan was getting his things ready to leave for home when He was actually supposed to be heading to lunch, you know, now that he was in first grade, heading to lunch with the rest of the class. So Linda, his teacher, asked him what he was doing. He said, well, I'm I'm going home. Linda tried to explain that now that he's in first grade, no, he he has a little longer school day. And she said, listen, you you go eat lunch now, and and then you come back to the room and we do some more work before you go home. (laughs) Ryan looked up at her in disbelief, hoping that she was was kidding. Convinced of her seriousness, Ryan then put his hands, you know, on his hips, demanded, who on earth signed me up for this program? (laughs) You know, oftentimes as believers, uh, it's easy to feel like little Ryan, isn't it, when we consider the Christian life? I mean, requirements are daunting. Surely the Lord doesn't expect me to forgive 70 times 7. Surely he doesn't want me to turn the other cheek when someone hurts me. Surely God wouldn't ask me to give generously when there's so many things that I really want. (laughs) 
It isn't long before you begin saying, who on earth signed me up for this program? (laughs) See, to be a follower of Christ, not just an admirer, requires taking up our cross. And you notice, do you notice um, that's not just a one-time event? Taking up your cross, it's it's a daily commitment that we must make. You know, sometimes I think we imagine that giving our all to the Lord is like um, taking out a a $1,000 bill, you know, and and, and laying it on the table and all all at once saying, here, here's my life, Lord, I'm giving it all right now, just right here in this one time. Um, But the reality is that for most of us, Jesus, he sends us back to the bank and uh, has us cash in that $1,000 for quarters. We go through life putting out 25 cents or, or 50 cents here or, or there. Usually taking up one's cross, I got to tell you, it isn't glorious, friends. It's done in all those little acts of daily obedience, 25 cents at a time. I mean, it'd be easier to, it seems like to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder to live the Christian life little by little over the long haul, isn't it? This then leads to the paradoxical uh, fourth requirement that he gives us here in this passage. Losing your life to keep your life. Listen, if you try to save your life by accommodating yourself to the world, what results is the loss of real life. On the other hand, if you're willing to lose your life for the sake of God, then what you save is real life. Um, In other words, following Christ requires us to quit fighting for the controls of our life and surrender everything to him. To die to ourselves and to live for him. Listen, those of you who are parents, do you remember the first time that um, <laughs> your child, uh, now a teenager, uh, takes that driver's test and passes amazingly, you know, <laughs> and, and now demands the keys, wants to sit in the driver's seat? Do you remember that? I mean, it's a big moment in, in your life when you had to hand someone else the keys to your car, isn't it? Up until now, you know, I've been driving. I mean, I get to choose the destination. I get to choose the radio station. I get to choose the route. Uh, I get to choose the speed. I mean, you're in the passenger seat. I get to choose all that stuff. But if we are to change seats, if you now become the driver, I have to trust you, don't I? It's all about control. Whoever's in the driver's seat is the person in control. A lot of people find Jesus handy to have in the car as long as he's in the passenger seat. Because something may come up, you know, or I require the service of, uh, of Jesus. I mean, I have a health problem, so I need some help. Um, I, you know, you're, you're in the car. I want you in the car, but, but I don't want you driving, Jesus. Listen, if Jesus is driving, I'm not in charge of my life anymore, am I? If he's driving, I'm not in charge of my wallet anymore. If I put him in control, there's no longer a matter of of, uh, giving some money now and and then when I'm feeling generous or when more money happens to have come in. (laughs) Now it's his wallet. It's scary. If Jesus is driving, I'm not in charge of my ego anymore. Um. I no longer have the right to satisfy every self-centered ambition. No, it's his agenda. It's his life. I'm not in charge of my mouth anymore. (laughs) I don't get to gossip and and flatter and cajole and deceive and rage and intimidate and manipulate and exaggerate. To be a follower of Jesus is to get out of the driver's seat and hand the keys over to to him (laughs) I'm I'm still fully engaged in fact I'm more alive now than I've ever been before but it's not my life anymore it's his life 
Listen, friends, it all comes down to this. All comes down to this. Will you be wholly devoted to Jesus from your heart or will you not? Following Christ is a full-time job. It's not a weekend hobby. Are you a follower or just an admirer? You know, I've been thinking a lot about that category of being an admirer, what it looks like. Because I think it's widespread in our day. And I want to be clear as possible, uh, as clear as I can about this. If you ask folks in the admiring Jesus category, um, do you believe in Jesus? They most likely will say, yes. Sure, I believe. I believe in Jesus in my own way. (laughs) They may go to church. Maybe they've been going to church for years. They may volunteer They may give some stuff, but they want to retain control of their lives. If getting too close to Jesus would mean risking something that they don't want to risk, like their success at work or or changing their lifestyle or, or humbling themselves to get help with a crumbling marriage or getting serious about immersing their minds in in, in scripture rather than just drifting along. We're not sleeping with uh, anyone uh, anymore with somebody, you know, or, or uh, getting help with their, with their anger, some habit maybe that they have. Then deep down in the secret place of their soul, they want to be able to say, no. <laughs> they want to be able to say to God, hands off, God. This is my life. And so they admire Jesus, but they'll try to maintain a certain distance between um, them and him. Let me say it again. Jesus never invites anyone to admire him. He only invites us to follow him. And friends, I got to tell you, this is an eternal issue. I mean, tells us such in verse 26. Do you notice this? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. In other words, reject Jesus in time and he will reject you in eternity. Are you a follower of Jesus? Or just an admirer? (laughs) Now listen, I, I've been at this long enough to know that um, a lot of people, when confronted with this cha- challenge, will feel uh, deep inside, you know, I've, I've got some sin. I've got some guilt. I'm not a spiritual giant. I'm not spiritual enough to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. <laughs> but friends, let me tell you, here's the gospel. Jesus comes to you, and Jesus says, Yes, you have a sin problem. And I got to tell you, it's much worse than you think. But then he follows it up very quickly with the promise that you are more loved and more accepted than you ever dreamed. And Jesus says, listen, I will wipe your slate clean if you will confess your sins and repent. To follow Jesus means... I'll do, I'll try to do what he says. Yes, I will mess up a lot. So, Lord, I'm going to need his power. I'm going to need your power. And so I say to him, God, with your help, God, with your help, as best as I can, I will do what you say. I'll give you my life. I'll give you my time. I'll give you my wallet. I'll give you my, my obedience. I got to ask you this question this morning. If you're here, you're listening online, why would you not make this commitment? Why wouldn't you make this commitment? Why would you not give your full devotion to this man? I mean, he doesn't present present himself as, as a good spiritual, moral, religious leader, a teacher to be admired from a distance. No, he presents himself as master, as Lord. 
as the Messiah of God, one to be followed and served and obeyed and worshipped. There's no other way. He is it. He's it. Before we gather around the Lord's table this morning, I'm going to invite you now just to close your eyes, bow your heads, because I want to give you a moment this morning just to respond, a few moments to talk with God and, and in your heart respond to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? Now, I know a lot of you here are already committed to Christ. You've committed your life to Jesus. Praise God. But God might be raising some issues that you need to pray about right now. So I'm going to invite you to do that. Take some time, listen to him, confess before him, let God deal with you as you prepare yourself for taking communion. And I got to tell you, if you are here this morning, if you are listening online and you've never clearly committed your life to Jesus, if you've never clearly confessed your sin and repented and wholly devoted your life to Christ, I want to give you a chance to make that commitment this morning. You say, God, I'm crossing the line from being an admirer to a follower. No more playing games, no more half measures. I have never fully devoted my life to following Jesus and, and express that to you, so I'm going to do that right now. And I got to tell you, if that was your decision today, I want to encourage you to find another follower of Jesus today and tell them about the decision that you made, and I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear if that was a decision you made today to become a follower of Christ. Email me, contact me, call the church office this week. I'd love to encourage you and know that. God, we thank you this morning for who you are. We thank you that we get an opportunity to (laughs) follow you, to give our lives wholly to you, to take up our cross. God, might you give us the strength daily to do just that. Your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Jesus, the son of God, the the Lord in the upper room, before he was betrayed and before he went to the cross to die for our sins, he had a supper (laughs) with his followers. And it was during that supper that he gave them the command to celebrate um, and remember what he does has done for us on the cross. This bread represents Christ's body, broken and beaten and given over to death for, for us. It was during that supper also that the cup, He took that cup, which represents his blood, his his life, which was sacrificed so that we might have a relationship with God. This communion is for anyone who has received Christ as their Savior, has become a follower of his. If you're here this morning, just checking this whole faith thing out, I, I just invite you just, you know, not take communion. It's about being honest. Because this is for believers. If you're here this morning and you're a believer, we would love to invite you to join us in taking communion this morning. Because our salvation, your salvation, my salvation, rests on nothing that we have ever done, but completely rests on Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. It's by faith that you've been saved, not by any works. Let's prepare our hearts for communion. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away slain for us and we me.
our Savior this morning. We thank you for your body which you gave so willingly for us on the cross. And for your blood which you obediently poured out for our sake so that we might experience your grace and your forgiveness. So that we might have a relationship with you. We ask that you bless this bread. You bless this cup. In your son's precious name. The Lord, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it. When he given thanks, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Take, eat, in remembrance of me. same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood whenever you drink it uh, drink in remembrance of me let's drink together
Now, before I give the sending prayer, I have a special item I want to do. We want to say thank you um, to a special person here at First Free. Uh, this morning, we're going to tell you, say thank you to David Creasel Call. Um, the scripture, you read it, it's full of uh, uh, thank you notes, you know, in the Old Testament, the New Testament. This morning, we get an opportunity to say thank you to David. As our part-time business administrator, he is moving up to Fergus Falls area, uh, both him and Pam. David has served as our uh, business administrator for the past six years. Before that, he was our church treasurer, and so uh, we are glad there. Um, uh, we've been able to just... Uh, enjoy his gifts and abilities. Um, both Pam and, and David have uh, moved up there at Fergus Falls on their dream acreage and, uh, you know, their loving life up there, up further north. And uh, so we want to say with the Apostle Paul, I thank my God every time I remember you, David, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. And indeed, we do that for David. Let's receive the sending prayer this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Go in his peace today.